Welcome everyone. I see attendees joining right now. That's so fantastic. We're here at the end of our day. We're going to just wait a couple more minutes before we dive into this last special presentation for EBCO's Innovation Open House. Thank you so much for being on. And we are going to dive in now. So tell us where you're calling in from. Welcome to EBCO's Innovation House, Open House. I've seen lots of you on earlier sessions and actually a couple new ones joining right now, which is super exciting for us, especially for you East Coast people. I know it's, it's late in the day, but I promise this is worth it. This is our last event of the day. It has been incredible. It has been jam packed. And we are so excited to bring to you improving your core strength with EBCO, innovating on core products in a time of uncertainty. For those of you who do happen to be new, we are a trend-powered innovation company. We're trend and consumer experts that connect the dots between our clients' existing insights and custom trend research to set the path for innovation opportunities. And just a quick glance before I turn it over to our hosts, you can see the full schedule here from our Innovation Open House. If there's anything here that piques your interest that you did not happen to have time or the ability to join today, have no fear, we will be sending these out at the end of the week. You are lucky to be on this one live. Live is always so fun, but don't worry, we will have access to everything. On that note, I am going to turn it over to our last definitely not least, most amazing host of the day, Catherine and Megan, to kick us off on our final presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us, especially for those, as Aaron said, on the East Coast, where it's the end of your day. Uh, I'm Megan. I've been working in the design and innovation space for almost 15 years, um, working on the client success team to really help partner with our trend directors and um, uh, grow and manage and, and work with all of our fantastic clients. And I'm partnering here today with Catherine and I'll let her introduce herself. Everybody, I'm Catherine. You might've seen me in a few other sessions. So I am a director here at EBCO. I've been here for almost two years now, but I've been working in trends and innovation for over a decade. So um, Megan and I bring a lot of really good, exciting um, passion to this space that we spent so long here. So we're excited to show you a few things that we've got lined up. So what exactly are we talking about today? So today we're going to discuss, number one, why is innovation at a time of uncertainty still important? You know, that burning question. When we think about uncertainty, a lot of the time you want to pull in, stay safe, don't do anything too risky. So why do we think innovation is still important and how can we innovate? Which is our second space. How do we drive innovation when we feel that we need to innovate in a less risky way, right? Uh, to innovate on our core. And then we'll take a case study on how we've done it with a, with a partner client to innovate around a core offering. So let's start with the first idea. Why, what is this time of uncertainty and why is it important? We wanted to tackle this head on because uncertainty is really kind of the default for our world right now. So if you think of it, even from the lens of a consumer, not a brand marketer, not R&D, not innovation, the typical consumer market basket of goods, meaning the amount of money you're paying for your regular basket of food or groceries has increased by 8.5% annually. It's the largest jump since the 80s, guys. So you're, that pinch you're feeling at the grocery is real. And of course, you have the potential for the recession. I and mean, you have people saying we're already in the recession, right? There's uncertainty even about that uncertainty. And then looking forward, even for those here in the U.S., obviously for those in Europe, the war in Ukraine has had implications on things like commodity prices, um, really stability, obviously political stability as well. Global uncertainty has surged. So there is something called the World Uncertainty Index. It measures it across the globe. How uncertain are people feeling? And it's been this huge jump for this year. And of course, looking at the past, uh, for several of us, we think about uh, the idea of a post-pandemic, post-COVID life, but we're still adjusting, you know, we have new work-life balance, there are new habits, there's long COVID, there's an unpredictable labor market. So at all fronts, we're being hit as consumers, as people, but also as marketers who have something to sell, who have something to offer the world. 
So that's why when we are operating in a situation like this, uncertainty can change business drastically. Because oftentimes the way we grow business is through penetration, right? We're penetrating new markets, we're developing new products, that's how we grow. But there are a lot of headwinds against that right now. So supply chain uncertainty, we talked about that previously. Do I really want to develop a new product if my machines, if it's uncertain, my raw ingredients are really going to make it? Do I want to innovate knowing that it's going to be more expensive for my customers and me to get that um, because price has increased both on raw goods or on the shelf? And even if I can get it on the shelf, there's consumer lack of confidence. They don't want to be out there exploring. They want to buy their tried and true items. They're tried and trusted that they know their family will like, that they know will get enjoyed, whatever that may be, whether that's food or Bev or a car or clothing, et cetera. So while we know innovation is important, it can be really risky, especially with a stat we found that six, around 60 to 90% of all innovation in food and bev fails within two years, which is a lot. It gets really risky. And um, right now, of course, we're talking about food and bev. This will be a theme throughout the presentation, just as an industry we wanted to focus on. But this is true for generally any industry. But let's see. So I want to do a quick poll here. So thinking about innovation and thinking about uh, growing your space. When General Mills bought Pillsbury from Diageo, what do you think happened? And I'm going to pull up a poll here um, just so that we can uh, see what you guys think. Do you think it raised their profit? decrease their profit, or General Mills was like, uh-uh, mistake, I'm going to divest this at a loss. Obviously, I might have kind of preempted the answer here, but I do want to see what you guys think. Ooh, somebody challenging our, our winners. Okay. So most of you said Pillsbury operating profit was raised by 70%. A few of you said it was decreased. Congratulations to the people who picked the first option. Um, it did raise their operating profit by 70%. And they did this, there were a lot of case studies about this because it was, in, it was innovating around their core. General Mills and Pillsbury had a lot of advantages that worked together. Like they had the same you know, raw ingredients and equipment. They had the same positioning for customers. They had the same kind of idea of what their customers uh, company wanted to be. And because they were innovating so closely to their core product, if they still were able to raise that profit by a huge amount, by 70%. So innovation is not necessarily always bad. It just has to be considered. Okay. So what are these ways? How do we uh, how do we innovate in ways that are smart than the way General Mills and Pillsbury did it, right? It becomes this balance where you're sticking to tried and tested, meaning I'm not going out on a limb, I'm not inventing something wildly out of there, but I'm also not, but I'm also still delivering accessible novelty and accessible excitement that doesn't alienate consumers. In short, I'm innovating on my core offerings. So what McKinsey said is that those prioritizing growth opportunities in areas where they're so-called natural owners, those are the kinds of innovations that generate the best shareholder returns. And this is just for when we're talking about um, good times or times of feast. Even in times of famine, we have our favorite lipstick effect, right? Which is basically simply that consumers will save on big ticket items, but they'll spend more on small feel-good products. Note that this doesn't mean that it's cheap. It actually means that they are feel-good products. They are instant gratification and they might be considered luxury. So the small chart on the right will show you um, that things like, for example, in France, retail assignating, but impulse ice cream rows. In the UK, they started buying sugar confectionery cookies. In Germany, they were buying high quality chocolate. Um, in Italy, they were buying um, not new beds, but new bed coverings, right? So all these accessible uh, innovations that are close to the core, but help me, um, help me grow. 
So for example, this happens in snacks as well. So for example, um, where you might have cocoa puffs, which is considered, you know, everyday item, and it might just take a little bit of innovation around that to say, hey, well, here's a limited edition item, right, that can really drive interest. Of course, you can go too far. I love this example. Um, Sabine and company saw that as I move farther away from my core, my odds of success actually decrease significantly as I move from um, something that's well within my meal house to further and further out, my success rate declines. And this is exemplified by my favorite case study, Evian. Everybody knows Evian. They're a famous water company. They sell drinking water and they're twist was they figured they are the experts in water. So where else can they put water? And so they decided to invent a water bra. So it's a bra with water inside meant to be more comfortable and, you know, really um, form fitting. Obviously this failed, they pulled it off the shelves immediately. Nobody has seen it since, but it's, so it can go too far. But on the other hand, if you take a look at Apple, for example, you see how it's rising from for the first iPhone, then they moved into the iPad, then they move into the Apple Music, then they moved into AirPods, really taking small steps um, from step one to step two, step three, small incremental innovations from things like color or new formats can really drive um, your shareholder value, can really drive your revenue. And that's where trend work comes in. So trend work, the way at least here in EBCO we do it, we're still basing it very, very closely, customizing it to your category, your product, but really just looking at what is adjacent, where we can grab inspiration. So you're still delivering really fresh innovation, innovation that might exist without um that doesn't exist in your category, but still sticking close to where your heartland is and where your customer is really familiar. So our favorite example here is Magic Spoon. So cereal is such a mature category, right? Not a lot changes here, but with um, that's why Magic Spoon was such a disruptor, right? It's still a cereal. It's still the same flavor everybody loves. It's still in the same box. And they only had that small twist, right? Where they're reinventing it with different ingredients, cleaner ingredients. And Magic Spoon has soared, done so well. They're such a disruptor to the category and they've become so well known, right? So this is the kind of innovation that we wanted to talk about in this presentation, right? How do we start innovating and products that are our gold mines within our portfolio that we know will do well. And we just, how do we add that twist and that new newness to it to really drive um, interest from our customers? Yeah, so when we think about how to do that, we've identified and, and employ some, some best practices um, to really help drive innovating on your core. Um, the first one being about exploring adjacencies and asking what can you learn from categories or products that employ similar ingredients or technologies or behaviors? Uh, for example, if you're looking at opportunities to innovate um, the hair dye experience or hair dye products, what can you learn from emerging trends and products and behaviors around drink mixology? And so what are things that we can learn from categories that are similar to ours, but also employ similar behaviors and similar interactions with products or services. Then you wanna take you know, what you're learning, take the trends, identify clusters and, and group them into articulated opportunities. You know, coming into ideation sessions, um, you know, there's no shortage of great ideas, but really focusing, um, building on opportunity areas that are really gonna provide um, fuel to your organization requires some structure. And so creating those opportunities to really guide and inspire ideation is critical. And you wanna look at, at prioritization efforts. And to do this, it's really important to bring different areas of expertise from across your organization. Different areas have um, important domain knowledge that you wanna bring into the conversation. They'll have different insight to give that prioritization, that essential input. You can do things like map those opportunities and ideas against uh, an effort versus impact chart to see where you can really get the most bang for your buck in the near term and where there are going to be opportunities that might take a little longer. You also want to leverage the balanced breakthrough model when evaluating ideas and ask if 
these ideas are desirable to our consumers. Um, are they feasible for us to produce? And does this make financial sense for our business, either by generating new revenue streams or reducing costs? On the next slide. And so another really fantastic tool is, is looking at the 10 types of innovation. Um, you can really push beyond just products or services and ask, you know, can we change our product model, our profit model? Is there something about the way we're producing it or delivering our products or services? Or is there an experience or supporting service that we can create to grow our product ecosystem? So really pushing beyond um, uh, the 10 types of innovation can really help you push beyond your core. But on the next slide, if we really are trying to stay more near term and focus on um, our core, it's helpful to identify what are some triggers that you can pull to, um, to help you think about ideating um, in a more near-term way. So for example, if one of your mandates is that you have to stay within your current manufacturing capabilities, look at levers that you can pull to inspire that ideation. For example, on a snacking program we worked on, we looked at what would their core product look like if we if we change just one base ingredient? Or what does it look like if we introduce new flavors or new ways to package the product? So thinking about what those levers are um, closer in to your core is a great way to fuel ideation. When also thinking about prioritization, you need to focus on your core and you don't necessarily have the budgets to push into those farther out, um, higher effort um, areas. You can look at scoring um, to identify where to push first. And you can add an additional layer, excuse me, an additional layer of rigor, say that 10 times fast, mm -hmm. uh, an additional layer of rigor um, and look at, um, you know, does this fit our brand? Does this push into new white space for our category? So adding that additional um, rigor to your prioritization can really help you surface um, opportunities and ideas that are gonna be impactful um, in the near term and close to your core. So looking at some of those um, best practices, we're really curious to know, um, are you guys doing any of these? Are you doing all of them? Maybe just one or two, or maybe none. And it's an opportunity for you to start bringing in some different tools to help fuel ideation in your organization. So we're beginning to see the results roll in. They are- Interesting. Polarized. I know. Okay. At first it was all or nothing. Now we're seeing a pretty even split. For sure. Okay. That's really interesting. Okay. So I think that's everybody. Great. So all right. Completely even. <laughs> that's that's really interesting. Um, all right. So let's take a look at an example of, of how we've done this. Um, Thinking about cereal, you know, it's it's a it's a tough category. It's a really dense category. And so, how do you employ some of these ideas and best practices? And what are some of the results for us or that we experienced when um, innovating around cereals? If you want to jump to the next slide, so we start with you know looking at the fractal map and using this. Um, and if you enjoy and join some of our earlier sessions, you'll recognize this tool uh, as something that we do to really. Um, make sure that we're pushing boundaries and really exploring relevant adjacent trends, looking across the fractal map to really make sure we're casting a wide net. If you look at the next one. So we translated that, what we found into a, a, a trend framework that identified five emerging trends around this, um, around this area. And so looking at ways to um, Organize these into these opportunity areas was really important again to, to create these kind of categories and buckets to inspire and guide ideation. Really important um, to put that structure around it to create that focus. Yeah. And on the next slide. Oh, please. Oh, you know, I just wanted to say that um, looking at this, coming from the fractal map into this, you can already see how Megan and I, how the rest of the team are beginning to innovate on the core, right? So it's still cereal, but we're seeing we can innovate in terms of time, in terms of the kind of meals. Is it breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Is it premiumization? Do we look at sustainability? Do we look at functional ingredients? Do we look at play and sensorials, really figuring out these different levers we can start pulling to make them completely different. 
Yeah, so if we narrow in on one, uh, what we're calling flavor mashups, if you go to the next slide, you can see how this comes to life and how this can um, guide teams into thinking about um, new ways to, to explore flavor, new ways to um, kind of push into to different um, flavor ideas. Um, looking again at kind of across the category, if we're talking about cereal, but we're looking at what are, what are cake bite mashups or donut and ice cream sandwich mashups. Um, and really kind of pushing that creativity to start to surface things that are gonna be really meaningful uh, and innovative for this category. And the next one. So then, you know, through that prioritization effort, you can see, you know, flavor mashups might be a little farther out. So let's have our team look at some of what some of these earlier near in uh, trends are that we can deliver today. But it's really important to make sure you hold on to some of those longer term uh, ideas so that as budgets start to open up and, um, and organizations are ready to push a little bit farther out, you've got that fuel um, and you've got those ideas ready to go to start pushing into areas further out. So this is really useful for, um, obviously, if you've got your own pipeline, uh, it's, it becomes this really uh, great exercise with great ROI, right? You're doing it once, but you're identifying things that you can do today, maybe next year, maybe in the future. But also, if you're a B2B company, this helps you really uh, customize for your clients. What's their risk appetite? Do they want to do something really near end where it's just like, okay, let's just talk about no allergens, no nuts in this, which everybody is already doing so they could be a follower or are they really far out they're saying we want to risk it all put it we're all in putting it all on the table and we're going to start looking at things we can do around brain chemistry and work here really so we can start thinking about how do we customize to make it really great for you and for your clients so we've created a little worksheet here um, and you can take this home. We're gonna provide a link in the chat and use this with your teams to explore different levers that you can pull to innovate against your core. Um, we, you know, we pr provided the examples that we talked about um, from snacking. So rethink what the levers are for your industry and, and your core products. Is it looking at technology? Is it looking at um, you know, service services? Um, that can support your core or looking at flavor. So, you know, ask yourself what, and ideate with your team around that. What are some of those different levers that we can pull? Um, and then use the, use the worksheet to help, um, help your teams kind of come up with new ideas um, and really push into to areas that expand your core into new adjacencies um, and really help strengthen that core offering that you have. We provided an example here. So, you know, if you're coming up with new snacking ideas, um, pulling some of these levers, what are, how about air fried chickpea smoked barbecue crisps? How can I get all the really complex flavors today? Uh, I can <laughs> um, see you. <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, it's really, it really kind of a, 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 an important way to, to innovate and ideate and, and use tools that really can help your teams think about um, even your core products in a new and different way. So I love this, Megan, because I feel like, especially if, um, again, you're one of our food and Bev clients, a lot of the time you think, oh, we can only change flavor and that's the only lever we can pull. But we just got off a project um, with a frozen veg manufacturer. And actually what they found is a really rich area of innovation was not flavor, but really cooking method. Understanding that so many people have bought air fryers in the past mm -hmm. couple of years, they've got the instant pot in their, in their pocket, they've got microwaves. What are the different ways that we can innovate around our core product to change and with just cooking method unlocks a whole different innovation pathway for them. So really being able to think about the levers first and thinking really um, using a fractal map to think through adjacencies can really get you somewhere interesting. Great. Great. So that concludes us. If we have, if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. But otherwise, we will be sending the recording through um, so you guys can digest, uh, replay anything you want to hear. And if you need the deck or you want to talk 